In this video, I will show you most of what was involved in erecting one of these self-supporting corrugated steel buildings. Like most everything else, there are right and wrong ways to put one of these together. If you put it together incorrectly, it will be very difficult or impossible to correct later. For their size, they are very light compared to a conventional wood frame building, which results in low ground loading. This means you can build one of these where erecting a conventional structure would be difficult, expensive, and or prohibitive. Fireproof, termite proof, no shingles to replace. They are also very secure compared to the thin metal sheet used in pole barns. Having no internal support structure or trusses, they are very open and spacious. These are designed to conform to the building codes for the county and state where they will be erected, taking into account wind and snow loads. A sample of the insulation used under the concrete slab, it's a half inch thick, has an aluminum foil layer. You need a thermal break between your slab and the earth. You don't want to heat the earth under the building. You want to keep that heat in the concrete slab. And that foil layer is there to reflect the radiant energy back up into the slab. A building kit is delivered on a flatbed trailer. All of the pieces stack together and the whole thing is very compact, but it is heavy. Generally, an individual will need to arrange to have several people available to help unload the pieces by hand. There are a couple of different methods for connecting the building to the concrete footing. I have found the industrial base plates anchored to a stem wall to be the fastest and most secure method. This is what I recommend to everyone. The first few arches must be held at the correct center height, square to the foundation and level. As the arches are raised into position, only a few bolts and nuts are used to hold them together. After all the arches are in place, a few center supports are used to make certain the building is standing at the designed height. Wiggle it around until the arches are aligned, level, and square. Then you can install the remaining bolts and nuts, but only finger tight. When all the bolts and nuts are in place, you can proceed to tighten them symmetrically, bottom to top, both sides evenly, arch by arch. You will want to power wash the inside of the building to remove mill oil from the metal especially if you intend to spray foam insulation, otherwise the foam will not adhere to the metal. Washing will also keep dust from sticking to the oil. I use the steel end walls for the rear wall of my buildings. However, since I wanted to have a conventional garage door in the front, I found it best to use a wood framed front end wall. I developed my own method for cutting a hole, framing out an opening for an exhaust fan on the steel end wall of these buildings. This opening in no way weakens the end wall and it does not leak. I used the building bolts to attach the chains for the fluorescent fixtures. You need to use a spreader bar to hold these chains at the correct distance and angle so that after you spray the foam, your lights will hang correctly you'll have a difficult time getting to these building bolts once this foam is in place. I am a dealer for Pioneer Steel Buildings. I have personally erected two of these buildings and developed my own method of connecting the wood frame end to the steel building. I have also come up with a number of methods for installing various other items. Anyone purchasing a building from me has the advantage of my experience including the various tips and tricks I have developed. A blast gate allows you to easily shut the ventilator for when you wish to heat or cool the building. The main reason for putting the plywood on the wall is to protect the foam. Now this is a, a high density closed cell foam. It's pretty tough stuff, but still, if you're in a working garage, you don't want to knock a chunk out of your foam. You paid good money to put this up here. And this gives you the ability to hang tools or whatever else you need to hang on your wall 
trying to hang things directly onto a metal building like this is, is not easy. And this uh, that solves the problem. This has been sanded and given two coats of polyurethane. My radiant heat system, you have two circulating pumps. These are in series. I need a little more head than what one pump would do by itself. Mixing valve, there's a hot water heater outside on the other side of this wall. The hot water heater hangs on the outside of the building. I didn't want an open fire someplace where there's a tendency to have gasoline fumes. I'm using a glycol mixture so I don't have to worry about this freezing. I only heat this building if I want to or need to. I take the hot water from the hot water heater, goes through this mixing valve, mixes some of the return fluid so that the water that's going out to the floor is at a desired temperature. When you bring a system on like this, you do not want to heat the floor too quickly. You don't want to crack the floor. So you just bring the temperature up gradually. And the flow rate going through the two zones is controlled on the return side by these flow control valves. This tank is just an expansion tank. This is the header tank. It holds about five gallons excess fluid. And I pressurize that to 20 pounds with nitrogen. I have a thermostat it tells the zone controller when to start and stop the pumps. That's all there is to it. It's a very simple system, quite reliable. I installed two of these small air conditioners. This is about the smallest window air conditioner you can buy. The two of these units on the hottest of days, these will bring the temperature down in here in about three or four hours. And if you want to maintain the temperature in here, one of these units will keep it very comfortable. This closed cell foam is very efficient. It's high density. It's the same type of foam as what they would use on the roof of a building. And the thickness on this is about two and a half to three inches. People will want to know why I say you need to drill holes into the concrete walls and epoxy the rebar into position. In a conventional building, the weight is straight up and down on those walls. In this building, even though it's bent to hold the shape, if we get an external load like snow or wind, it has a tendency to make that building want to do this. If the building goes like this, those walls will either rotate out or move out, and you'll have a failure. You want to take the rebar, drill it into the concrete, pound it in there firmly with epoxy, and we're going to tie both of these walls together with our rebar. That will keep those walls from doing this or moving out. And that is what gives the strength to this building. With a good solid foundation under it, the building won't move an inch. If you don't do the concrete work correctly, the building will do that.